comes in now that we've taken roll and you know, announced that they've joined us. Yep. Um, okay, the first thing on the agenda is public participation. Do we uh, have any members of the public that wish to make a comment? I see two hands. I see Monica Prince and then I see Sarah Hong. So would you enable Monica to speak, please? No, no problem. Monica, you're able to speak. And I see Ellen. So Ellen, I will mark you as attended. Hi, I'm Monica Prince from the Ypsilanti Senior Center. Many of, many of you have met me. Um, I've been here for 16 years now. Um, um, I'm talking, I came to talk a little bit about the Say Yes to Seniors um, advocacy group. Um, we took a break after the last time we tried to get a millage on the ballot and um, there were a number of reasons why it, it failed at that time. Um, and, but we do see that it's something that is very necessary now. And um, we are up and running again. We took a little break, but now we're back. Um, right now we are working on a couple of things. We're working on making a timeline for um, what we need to do to get something on the ballot for the November uh, election. Uh, we are also um, pulling together all the data like everybody else is doing right now. Um, and uh, we of course will be able to share it with you when, uh, when it actually happens. Um, it's an open meeting. Uh, that we have every other Thursday. I think that's what it is. I can't remember my calendar. Um, and uh, anyone's invited, you can, um, the Say Yes to Seniors website is still up. And I, I think you can sign up there if you want updates and want to get, come into the meeting. Um, and uh, if you can't find that or that, um, you can get in touch with me. Uh, actually, my best email is monica at ipsyseniorcenter.org. And, um, you know, I can send you the link to get onto the meeting. We're, of course, doing Zoom right now. So um, we just wanted to let you know that we're working and we're gonna try and get this ballot on and we'd love your support uh, either individually or as a, you know, you, ha you have the ear of the Congress or commissioners right now. So um, if that's possible, you know, it'd be great to, to, for you guys to let me know. Yeah, can you just... This is for... Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, sorry, Thank I've got you. a delivery man coming in at the same time. Um, Monica Prince. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's the problems with me being here by myself. I do have a sticker in this room for you so you don't have to pick it up. Sure, that'd be good. Uh, Monica, have you finished your remarks then? Yes. Okay, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for your... The next person uh, that has a hand raised is Sarah Hong. Okay, Sarah, you should be able to speak now. Great, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh, got back to it. Sorry. There we go, I think I just... Can you hear me? There we go. No, okay. Okay, so I'm Sarah Hong. I'm the Chief Program Officer of Jewish Family Services of Washtenaw County. I've had the opportunity to present before. I want to echo what uh, Monica says. So I too am speaking today in regards to Say Yes to Seniors. So just to level set for a moment, Say Yes to Seniors is an advocacy group really investigating and actively pursuing a Washtenaw County senior millage. The 2.0 version that we have right now has learned a lot from the first go around, and we really are engaged in a very robust effort. As Monica said, we're meeting every other week 
We have membership in this advocacy group from over probably 10 local uh, human service agencies serving the sector and community participation. It's really our position that a millage could provide critical structural funding. This is really important to contrast to say the ARPA monies, which we certainly hope will become available to the sector. But while those can provide short-term expenditures uh, in response certainly to pandemic needs, it's possible that the millage monies could help build upon uh, such momentum and continue to support some of those allocations. You know, we're seeing the product that the COA is doing in the hard work of the last year plus. And certainly I've had a chance to review the report that has been drafted that will be a subject today. And our hope would be that the extensive work of the COA and a product of which is this, this need summary, which clearly states the massive need, that the COA may ultimately recommend to the board of commissioners a few ways, more than one to address these needs. And that those would include an ARPA pathway as well as a millage. We fully recognize that the COA and Say Yes to Seniors are independent entities. We also want to say that we think it would be useful to have a meeting at this point, perhaps, to understand each other's positions, rationale, strategy, and timeline. We've heard, uh, I personally have heard a little bit about potentially the COA recommending uh, some, some governmental reallocations of monies and then in one to three years a millage. And that was news to, to me and, and the folks we're working with. And it just feels that in this small world where ecosystem, we're all cohabitating, it would be great for us to at least understand each other's positions. Uh, I'm personally a little concerned that if the COA makes a recommendation for millage in three years and say, yes, the seniors were to make a recommendation for this ballot, that it sends a very mixed message to the commission and would probably endanger both efforts and both timelines. So um, just hoping to open lines of communication uh, between the two bodies so that we can uh, better understand one another's positions and hopefully perhaps find um, some form of, of alignment uh, or, or recommendation. So again, um, that's pretty much the position over here, hoping that while you are a government body and truly can't you know, advocate for anything as an extension of the local government, that you would recommend a few ways to actually, you know, address, you know, when action items call to action for the board, the massive needs in the county, and that in addition to ARPA pathway, this would include a millage. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to speak at this time? If so, raise your hand. Marta, is it appropriate for us to respond to the comments? When we finish with the comments from the public, then there's an agenda item commission response to public participation. So Great. we'll take that up as soon as I assure that there's no one else from the public who wishes to speak. I do not see any other hands raised. So this is your last chance if you're trying to speak. Okay, um, now the agenda item is re um, commission response to public participation. And so if members of the commission wish to respond, please raise your hand and I'll call you on you in order. I see Bennett and then I see um, Stephen and then I see Margaret. So Bennett. Okay, well, I note that Monica said that especially now we need a millage and there is as well with Sarah's um, <clears throat> contribution um, a statement uh, that there is a sense of urgency. So um, I can just uh, accentuate that. And um, I am preparing a statement uh, on the um, social isolation and the uh, extended nature of it and its medical effects. And I uh, hope I can do justice to it. I don't have, um, I have limited documentation and I cannot rely upon my personal observation um, in uh, Lurie Terrace where we are ongoing. In other words, the lockdown is now, I believe, at least a month and uh, one can only hope. Thank you, Bennett. Uh, I have Stephen and then Margaret and then Jason in queue. So Stephen. 
Um, yeah, so I think as Bennett said, and um, I too have a sense of urgency um, to submit a recommendation in regards to, um, you know, sort of getting the millage on the ballot uh, this coming year. So as a, and I'm a, as a member of the millage committee, just wanted to share that. Um, I guess my question for Sarah was, where did you, um, where is the feedback that you're getting that um, the millage committee or the commission on aging is looking at waiting as long as you describe, because um, I think we've had enough input um, and a lot of work that's been done by the commission to suggest the great need that older adults have and a realization that ARPA will just be a very limited time funding. And we really, uh, that supports infrastructure more than it supports services, which clearly um, through multiple presentations that we've had um, to the COA that there is great need in our community. So Sarah, I don't know, um, just to get better understanding of your comment, um, why, why would you think that the COA is looking at a three-year timeline? I don't, I don't think probably at this time it's a good idea to have a back and forth, particularly if it's going to identify individual people. Maybe we could, you could take that up with her offline. Okay. Marta, just as you're, you know, um, I missed the first meeting or um, is there a reason to, um, to think that that's true? Is there... I, I think Elizabeth is in line to speak and we'll let her take that up. But I, you know, as far as I know, that's not accurate. Uh, so I have in queue, I have Margaret, then Jason, then Elizabeth, then Bonnie. So uh, Margaret, you're up. Margaret? Yeah, Marta, I didn't have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. you raised your hand. Jason, then you're up. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, to maybe offer just a word of caution. Uh, the, the Commission on Aging has been established by the Board of Commissioners to um, identify needs, advocate on behalf of older adults, uh, and make recommendations. And the Say Yes to Seniors group um, is actively pursuing the placement of a millage on the ballot. And I, I just want to offer a word of caution that um, members of the Commission on Aging um, should be careful about their statements as members of the Commission on Aging when it comes to the activities of Say Yes to Seniors and, and, and not mix the two, uh, the two things. Uh, uh, so uh, I think there, there, is a, there is a delicate line to, to maybe run there um, as the Commission on Aging um, cannot be in a position of taking, taking a position of um, advocating on behalf of passage of the millage. So uh, with that, uh, uh, Marta, I thank you for the opportunity. And I do have to note that my board of directors is meeting at 9 a.m. and I will have to leave at that time. Thank you. We have you. We have you up next as soon as we're finished with this section of the agenda. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're up next, and then uh, Bonnie. Very quickly, as chair of the subcommittee, looking at potential millage, we have not had any discussion about time a time frame. We take Jason's comments very much to heart. Our next step is to. Um, look at the data that is going to be presented later about the report in the report and see if there's additional information um, that might be necessary to gather to, to give enough data to the commission about needs. Um, and then just about social isolation, Bennett, I know I shared with you this, um, uh, Advise, State Advisory Commission on Aging report on social isolation, which has a lot of that research that you're talking about that you may find helpful. And other folks who are, for example, dealing with the ARPA's uh, submission or anything else wanting to address social isolation, uh, that might be a helpful reference to you. And I know it's posted on our website. Thank you. Thank you. I have Bonnie up next. Uh, I just recently have gone through all of the minutes um, looking for um, 
other things that I was researching. So I have gone through them very carefully. And there's never been a mention of millage discussion and timeline and post moment or anything just to re sure everybody that there is nothing in our minutes on that and there has not been a discussion on this on this body okay okay thank you uh steven you still have your hand up or do you yeah no i did want to i did want to respond jason that um i'm a little concerned about the comment if i heard it correctly to uh, totally understand why an advocacy group say, to the, say uh, yes to seniors is um very different from the commission on aging and those two should not be um, combined in any way. On the other hand, the idea that, um, I thought I heard you said that the Commission on Aging would not be in a position or should not be in a position to support a millage. I mean, I guess that my sense is that's exactly what the Commission on Aging is for, is to make strong recommendations about what is needed, not needed, is a millage needed, not a millage. Doesn't mean that the commission has to accept it, but in the long run, why are we here if not to um, make recommendations such as that, both identify need, sort of help to structure it as a, as a first step. And then the, again, the Washington County commissioners can veto or accept. But so I was very, very confused by that comment unless I heard it wrong. Okay, I have Dina up and then Jason, you can address that if you want to um, after that. That is my exact same question. So I'm going to defer. Um, Dr. Stein said everything I wanted to say. So I would love to hear Jason's response. Okay, Jason, you're up. All right, thank you. So um, I am, as individual members of the Commission on Aging, we can all have our own views and opinions on whether a millage is needed or not. The Commission on Aging can recommend at the Board of Commissioners um, place a millage on the ballot for the voters to consider. What I do not believe the Commission on Aging can do as a body is go out and advocate for the passage of a millage question. That is the role of a ballot question committee, which is what Say Yes to Seniors has been doing for three plus years. Um, so I, I, I do not want anybody to put they put themselves in any kind of jeopardy um, by being a, being a member of the Commission on Aging um, uh, and making statements about vote yes on the millage, representing the Commission on Aging as a body. So I don't know if that's- No, that, that Jason, for okay. me, that um, that's very helpful. Okay. I, I thought I heard you saying that the Commission can't recommend the support of a millage to the commission on uh, to the Washington County commissioners. So you absolutely can do that. And that's in that's in the draft report that I read for this meeting. So great, great. Okay, bye. And then um, do you have anything else? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that last statement from Jason. So we submitted as a body a letter of recommendation for the um, the Wi-Fi, the broadband. Uh, proposal that went in. So you're talking something very similar like that. If a proposal to to be put on the ballot is is public knowledge, we as a body could send the um, board of commissioners a letter of recommendation that we support that proposal to be put on the ballot. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and you can, you can recommend. Funny. I think as what I mean, just does. recommend like yeah. we did with the wide, uh, like the broadband that we yes. did. In, in essence, the, the bottom line here is an official body, official governmental body cannot advocate for a yes or no vote on a millage proposal. Okay. You, you, can, you can recommend that it be placed on the ballot. You can recommend that it will address the needs that you've identified, um, but the body itself cannot pass a statement that says vote yes on the question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody else have anything before we move on to the um, report from the Board of Commissioners? We'll be taking this up again, I'm sure, during the uh, discussion about the needs assessment. Um, okay, Jason, uh, why don't you present your report from the Board of Commissioners? Great, thank you. Um, I, and I will be uh, quick, just in case there are any, any questions. Um, the Board of Commissioners has approved uh, ARPA 
American Rescue Plan Act funding 2.0 bucket. Um, we get that final approval on Wednesday night. Uh, and we are now moving on to ARPA 3, uh, which I, again, the timeline I'm being given is probably a summer discussion um, and wholly appropriate uh, the, um, uh, for consideration of a potential uh, older adult priority fund uh, to be considered. I know that was mentioned uh, during our meeting by one of the commenters um, that that might be a possibility. Uh, for something for the board of commissioners to consider. So um, that funding round is coming up and um, uh, if is your recommendation uh, that the board consider that, uh, I think the time is coming with your presentation, which I understand from Peter, maybe in April at the working session of the board of commissioners, that timeline is now coming together um, uh, for these opportunities to, to begin that, that uh, discussion. Uh, the work of you know broadband is an important issue uh, as well for many older adults and that work is continuing the five contracts uh, with uh, the, the contractors who will be doing that work hopefully is nearing um, conclusion and signing uh, to the point where we may be able to have some of the work begin this year um, so that was very exciting for me to learn um, last week as well um, in terms of uh, the Commission on Aging, in that presentation, like I mentioned, um, it appears that April is, is solidifying as the date uh, for that presentation to working session. Um, I think that the document that you have as a draft uh, here today is um, a very good document. And I think the, my colleagues on the County Commission will be um, very impressed by the product that is being put forward. Um, and to me, um, uh, you brings together those resources that have existed in the community um, into one place and really makes the argument as to why the Board of Commissioners needs to put some funding behind these needs and issues in our community. Uh, and whether that's ARPA money or asking for a millage to be placed on the ballot, whatever it might be, this document is an important piece uh, uh, in, in beginning that discussion. So uh, I want to thank everybody who worked on that and bringing it together um, through this commission's process because I, I think it's gonna have quite an impact with my colleagues, or at least I, at least it should, put it that way. Um, uh, with that, um, you know, we are entering our, our, what they're calling the quadrennial budget process. It's, a, it's really, a, I think the most intensive year of the four year budget process that we have. And I think the, op the opportunity is there for these arguments to be made uh, over the next several months. So I uh, look forward to uh, you know, those, those discussions with the board and, and doing my part uh, at that board table to make sure that voices of older adults are heard. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Yeah, I see Stephen and then Bonnie. Yeah, Jason, um, I just wanted to, maybe I, I listened uh, too clearly, but you had mentioned um, talking to the commission, uh, to the Washington County Commission on the ARPA funding or the millage. And as just, um, you know, I, I'm not saying, again, the committee, our Commission on Aging overall will, you know, make recommendations, but um, is there any reason to believe that you think that if the Commission on Aging supports both ARPA funding for the immediate needs and then um, millage for continuing need um, one more service oriented, the millage, one more technology infrastructure that, um, that the commission, uh, Washington County Commission will not support that? Is there any reason to believe it? I, I think that, um, I, I, don't, I did not intend it to be an or issue. I, I think it should be an and uh, approach. Uh, I, I cannot characterize what my eight colleagues are thinking at this point. Uh, I. I do not. I do not speak for the board, and I, I cannot venture to imagine what their opinions might be at this time. I, I, again, I think I've repeated many times. I'm looking at this opportunity in April to come before the working session as as a kickoff kind of moment um, for these discussions, and I think uh, it will be an opportunity for my colleagues on the board of commissioners to express um, their questions, um, what other information they may desire to make their decisions. 
and, and is engaged in terms of where they stand on these issues. I'll, I'll be very clear. I support the ARPA pro, the ARPA money, and I support the millage question. So I'm one of I'm one of nine though. Great. Thank you very much, Jason, for clarifying that. Ronnie. Yes, um, Jason. I was asked a question. As you know, we're we're talking about the uh, ARPA money and I'm working real hard with the commissioners on that. And I was asked a question on what's the next steps or the process. So we know that MARTA is presenting in April the needs and assessment in our report. And we know that the ARPA 3.0 that you just mentioned is going to be coming up. So what is the actual process? You don't have to get into super details, but do you submit a, a, re a request? Do you present your request? That was the question that I was asked is mm -hmm. kind of like, what are, what can we anticipate is, is how the process flows. I mean, yeah, do they, so, do they, yeah go ahead. Yeah, Bonnie. So I, I appreciate the question because it's a question I've asked as well. Um, I can't get into great detail because I'm not aware there is great detail okay. um, on this. I think the, the way that I have approached it with other, um, um, you know, entities that are interested in ARPA money is that I submit a request to Administrator Dill uh, and ask him to place it on his list to consider uh, as we move forward. Um, I think that the presentation in April is the moment to make that statement, um, to make the statement on behalf of American Rescue Plan Act funds, um, to make a, a recommendation for that. Um, in addition to that, uh, when the report is uh, deemed ready by this commission uh, to submit, um, I will make sure that um, you know, I follow that up with a communication to Administrator Dill asking for uh, the recommendation to be considered for ARPA 3.0. Um, now, I, I don't know if Peter is still on the call and he can, he can shed any light on process, uh, but as far as I've seen about process, it is more or less commissioners submitting requests for consideration, which I am happy to do on these items. Okay, thank you very much. Peter, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, quickly, I would just, I would agree. There's not necessarily a, a single process, but uh, a, a very common process has been introduction of need than a request made by a commissioner. So I, I would just agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth, I have you up next. And then, uh, Stephen, do you mean to have your hand up or did you just forget to take it down? Okay. Um, just very quickly, Jason, um, as you've mentioned in the past, the importance of our individual communication with our individual commissioner. I'm wondering both in terms of the ARPA request when we've got it formalized as well as this report uh, on needs when we get that formalized, would it be helpful for each of us to take on the responsibility of contacting our individual commissioner and say, this is where we're at, this is why we're thinking this. Would that be a helpful discussion for each of us to have? Um, the straightforward answer is yes. The way that I would do it is I, when that report is ready to be distributed, I would forward that report to my particular county commissioner and ask for a time to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I see no other hands, so we're going to move ahead. Uh, the next step on the agenda is approval, approval of minutes and we'll need a motion for that. I move the approval of the minutes. I second it. Who was the second? Ellen. Ellen, okay. So we need a roll call vote. <coughs> Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Brest? Yes. Bonnie Weber? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? Yes. Steve Stein? Yes. Bennett Stark? Yes. Margaret Reynolds? Yes. And Jason Maschewski? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is subcommittee updates and we're gonna take them in the order on the agenda. So we'll start with communications. Yeah, so as far as communications go, we requested that Peter update the website with the 2021 presentations and we submitted those PDFs to him. 
Uh, we just ask that he gets him up before your presentation um, chair to the Board of Commissioners. We uh, formatted the needs assessment document. We are working, well, let's see. Oh, the communications team is working with the chair on a slide deck for the Board of Commissioners presentation. Um, the needs assessment is great and the Board of Commissioners are going to get it, but just have some slides for talking points. We'll be working with Marta on that. Um, and then um, in the last Healthy Aging Collaborative meeting, we were invited to uh, speak a little bit. So we asked that those members join the COA listserv, that they are welcome to join subcommittees and also welcome to point the older adults that they serve to do the same. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or? I think that was pretty straightforward. Okay, the next item on the agenda is needs assessment. And I think at this time, we're gonna look at the needs assessment <clears throat> Um, you know, fairly extensively uh, going over the entire thing. We are not going to talk about typos, grammar, or any other sorts of things like that. Those are going to be sent to Marie by Friday, March 25th. Um, we're only going to talk about concepts to make sure that we have the general idea. So who is going to share their screen and lead this? I've lost track here. Stephanie, if you could do that, I have to leave in a few minutes. Yeah, I can share my screen. Thank you. Second. And then um, both Stephanie and Bonnie take notes. So I'm sure that everything that we have to say will be captured between the two of them. Bennett, you had something? Yeah, I thought that we were going to have reports from the subcommittee. This is a that... subcommittee report, the needs assessment subcommittee. Oh, okay, thank you. So, um, Am I going to walk the, everybody through it or is there someone else going to do that in Marie's absence? You can go for it, Marta. Thank you, you're so nice. <laughs> I'm writing notes, I can't talk at the same right. time. That's fair. So if, um, actually, if I could have control of paging up, that would be really nice. Um. Or is there no way to, there's probably no way to do that. So just go ahead and page up to page two. Marta, at the top, there's, um, no, never mind. Usually under view options, there's a request to take. Control. That's okay. We'll just page. So let's go, you know, there's nothing on page one, I'm pretty sure. So okay. let's go to page two. That is also just the table of contents. So we'll move on to page three. And you'll notice that it's very carefully annotated draft. Um, because we don't want this document going out with anyone believing that it's the final document because it's still under preparation. This document will be taken up at the next meeting for final approval. I'll say so, that uh, Elizabeth had made a recommendation to me to link hyperlink those uh, three bullet points in the second column so the commissioners can easily find those reports uh, if they were to access this digitally. That's a good idea. I like that. That will be available probably to anybody who's got it electronically, not correct. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I everyone had a copy of this in advance. So does anyone have any concepts that's on this page that they have any issues with or want to talk about? And I'm going to try to catch hands, although I'm not seeing pictures very clear. They're very tiny little pictures. So anybody have anything? Marta, if you click participants at the bottom of your screen, the panelists come up on the right side and you'll be able to see any hands raised there. Well, I see their pictures, but. So if I were to raise my hand, do you see that? No. On the panelist? I see you, but I only see four, four, four people at one time. on. Oh, my I screen. see it. Now I found a way to do that. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so I see no hands on page two, the, ne the page that we're on now. So let's go on to the next page, page four. So this is a demographics page that talks about um, the different populations in the county. And you know, as is always the case, there are many different sources for data. And so those data are not always entirely 100% in agreement with exact numbers, but the concepts are there. I think the main point of this page is that the senior population is rising in comparison to the um, 
population of younger adults in the county. Anything on this page? Um, this is Steve. You know, the one thing that I would say is um, we might want to think about breaking it down in regards to different age groups because, you know, when I think about the majority of 60 year olds, they're thankfully um, relatively healthy. And when I say relatively, meaning fit, greater than 50% are relatively healthy. As you get to, you know, 75, 85, of course, there's an increase in amount of frailty, both cognitively and physically. And so I think the opportunity to, to break that down a little bit for the support of understanding might be worthwhile. Okay, well, so this, this is, Stephen, this is broken out by age 65 plus and then by age 85 plus, you're saying that's not sufficient? Um, I, it might be worthwhile having the, the 75 group as well. Um, just because it really is a, that those 15 years of the 60 to 75 does have significant sort of increased prevalence of cognitive and physical impairment that I have play a, a comment role in. to that, Stephen. Um, the gentleman who made this chart for us also had a second chart on the page that had that did have an age breakdown. Um, it's a lot of data to look at and we don't have a lot of space. So what I would like to do is hyperlink the name of this table to that document so they can see that breakdown. And I can send that sheet to you too, so you can you can see uh, what that looks like. Yeah, I like that idea, Marie. I sure. think that, that makes sense as long as there's that link so yep. people can get uh, more clarification. And then the other thing, um, and I, you may have this later on, and I apologize because I read this a while ago, was uh, the, the percentage of dual um, population. Do you have that um, in regards to how many people are at the poverty level? I mean, there's a lot of different types of data on that, both in for the Medicare's that are dual and then also um, other other data. Is that is that in there? Um, you think did you, okay. not, did you not take a look at the document that you got in advance? Yeah, I did, but it was a while ago. So that's why I apologize. Marie? Uh, yeah, we do, we do address some of that in there. Are you saying dual like Medicare, Medicaid? Yes, yes. Uh, so we don't address dual in uh, people who are duly eligible per se, but we do address people who are in poverty older adults in poverty. And I suppose that would that would be dual. We just don't well, call it no, that. No, no, I mean, there's, there are people that are, are not at the poverty level that would still receive you know, Medicaid. So it's it probably is a bigger number. Yeah, let's um, keep going through this yeah, and you'll see yeah. what we have. Yeah. Okay, so Ben, I see your hand up, so. Yeah, I would just um, accentuate what uh, Steve just said. In terms of decadal cohorts, the decades 70 to 79 and then 80 to 89, the hospitalization rate or serious hospital rate, hospitalization rate basically takes off. So um, that uh, does make a difference and I can attempt to deal with it in my addition. Okay, thank you. And I think we should point out that this page is simply demographics of age. It's not demographics of health. Mm. So, okay, any other comments on this page? Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, you have your hand up? Yes, I'd just like to make an overall comment. Um, there is so much rich and interesting data that is, um, can be useful, but I would urge us to consider the audience, um, which is primarily the Board of Commissioners, and some of that more minute detail, like the number of dual eligibles, may not be as helpful to them identifying the need. It's always a balance, isn't it, in any report between accessing all the data to make the case and narrowing it down to just focus on what we need to make the case. And I would urge us to just remember that sometimes less is more 
when it comes to presenting information. Yeah, and that is particularly going to be an issue with putting together the slide deck for this presentation to the Board of Commissioners. So it's going to be a job. <laughs> I do have to go to uh, my conference. I'm looking forward to listening back to all of your comments to making sure that we're incorporating that as well as Bonnie and Stephanie's notes. Okay, thank you, Marie. Okay, Bonnie, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to kind of um, support what Elizabeth just said. As, as going through this document and trying to help with this document and also trying to um, pull together the ARPA proposal document, when you're doing data-driven, there is so much data out there, we don't want to overwhelm. And I think this, is, this graph here basically is to show that the senior population in Washtenaw County is growing. And I, I like the breakout of 65 and then 85. I also like the the idea that if we have a board of commissioners that really want to do more deep dive, we have the links in the document on the citations. So if someone has an interest to find out more data, we put the links in there so that we give them the avenue to do it. We're not going to be able to put everything in this document. We'll lose them. So I, I, I support Elizabeth. Sometimes less is better. Um, I think this is a great graph. It, it gets a you know, very simply, you can look at that graph and see that, that the, you know, the age 65 and over is going to soon be greater than the, um, the other line. So um, I support what Elizabeth said and what Marie said, putting in links whenever we can. So people want more information and more data that they can look, you know, they can do more deep dive. And I think we should note that at the bottom of this page is an age distribution broken out by 10-year um, intervals. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe that address yep, right there was, I, I had forgotten it was there. Okay, we're going to move ahead to page five. So this is a, a demographics breaking out the um, municipalities, uh, populations, um, annual income, and differing abilities. So um, does anyone have any comments on this? And I see Bonnie's hand up, but I think oh, I'm sorry, I left it up. I'll take it down. Um, Bennett? Okay, well, this is not really significant, but I'm wondering if I'm missing something. It says differing abilities. Well, and then it has percentages. Now, these are abilities that people have, or are they disabilities? Does a person have a cognitive ability at six? 0.7% is the correct term disabilities or some other term that would mark or describe having an issue. I think that the term disabilities is kind of fallen out of use in favor of the term differing abilities, um, but I think they're being used synonymously. Okay, well, I guess um, I have not been part of that linguistic transition, but it does seem confusing for me, and it may be confusing for some other people, but okay. And you note that on the paragraph before the differing abilities paragraph, it says more than one in four have a disability. So those two terms are being used in different points in the same report. Okay. Stephen, you have your hand up? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, and I know we'll have another chance to respond, um, which I know I need to go into greater detail. But it mentions about 65 year olds who are not living in nursing homes or other institutions. I wasn't, I guess one question is, is other, other institutions that imagine um, does not include assisted living. Would you say that's true that it's, I mean, I'm trying to think about what other institutions are that, that's one question. And then the second would be, it says not living in a nursing home. Wouldn't we want to put at this spot a place that describes how many people are residing in a Washington County nursing home? Uh, okay, so I think I that, can respond to that. I think nursing homes or other institutions, we possibly should define that term at some point, Elizabeth? This is the definition from the census. This data is from the census. 
and the census deter defines nursing homes and other institutions as nursing homes or uh, prisons primarily and uh, not so um, they are institutions that have licensing requirements and uh, so this is the definition from the US Census and I think we kind of need to use it because um, that's where the data is from. Uh, certainly a little, um, an asterisk. I think most people don't think of other congregate living situations such as supported, uh, different kinds of supported housing as institutional, but perhaps an asterisk with that definition might be helpful. Yeah, I think we should so note that and ask Marita. Uh -huh. Can we scroll yeah. down just a little bit so I can see the footnotes on what eight is, where it's coming from? What you'll find is this is data that has been reported in the reports. Its origin is the census data. Is there, if, if I mean, well, I'm just going to ask is because I use the census data in mine as well, where you've got nursing homes and other institutions. If we if we cite um, the link to the census where they discuss that, I mean, could, you certainly that, could do that. You go that to the census website. So they, they can get more information on it if they want to. That's what I would Census recommend. website has definitions. And it also might be um, the census website is interactive, those of you who've not used it. And while some of this data is a deeper dive that um, has been used on what's uh, called the PUMS database, the public use database that the state demographer has manipulated. There's also a lot of data available just to anybody. Um, not all the 2020 data, very little of it is there yet because it hasn't been gone through the entire process of verification, but it might be an idea somewhere in here to put the link to that interactive, which is, I believe just um, census.gov, but uh, it, it comes up so that people can explore all the richness of the data. Bonnie, can you make a particular note about that so we bring it to Marie's attention? Sure do, I've got it written down. I have Margaret and then I don't know if Stephen intends to have your hand up or not. Yeah, no, I did, I did. Okay, Margaret and then Stephen. So um, is um, the statement that we're talking about 65 and older who are not living in nursing homes is has the footnote um, eight. And is, is that correct? Yes, it's referring to a report that cites the, sets, that cites oh. the census. So, it's, so a, it's not the original source. It is the... It's the census. Yeah, right. Do we have the original source? Would I'm just, I'm just perhaps, thinking... Perhaps we should change that citation to the actual census report. That's a good I've, thought. So I think it... Yeah, would you know that? or maybe better because this is how people how this report pulled the census data. I would say instead of changing it, I would expand it and add the census data. I would, I would, I would vote for more. I would, yeah, I'd put one idea. right after the okay. definition of there. Yeah, I put on there. Okay. All right, good. And Stephen, do you have another point? On yeah, this? yeah, I just, I mean, going back to the original um, thing about. Um, one is in regards to um, uh, Elizabeth, where you were saying, <clears throat> I thought I heard prisons and other things that are regulated. So I guess that I would think if that is true, that might include things like home for the aged that no, are regulated. It doesn't. It does not. Okay. It so does then, not. It means prison, uh, for example, the forensic center. Uh, okay. the mental state mental hospital. It's a very strict definition of other institutions. Okay, that's great. And then going back to the issue about living, not living in nursing homes or other institutions, 
it seems like a good place to put, okay, so how many people 65 and over are living in nursing homes or other institutions? Okay, let's note that and see if it comes up further along. And if not, we'll, you know, put, the, let's make a note of that for Marie, Bonnie. And, you know, if it doesn't come up further along in the report, we'll come back to it. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say is this seems like a, even if it does, since you're describing the population that you would not want to leave out that population in kind of in this moment in time and reading it. That's why I said, let's note it and check to see if it shows up elsewhere in the report and then come back to it if not. Yeah. Okay, moving on to page six. Okay, this is reporting. Um, this might be where the, the concern you have, Stephen, should be. Huh. So I don't, does anybody have anything else on this or should we consider that as a potential location for resident people who live in assisted living and other congregate living? Elizabeth? Um, I think this would be a great place because it highlights it a bit more. And I think Stephen's point was that needs to be information people need to see. Uh, what I don't know, it will take some researching um, to get that because I don't know if the census data easily breaks down that category between nursing homes and other things. I suspect that um, the folks either at the Community Foundation or at the Area Agency on Aging could help us if we need to find a different data source. Mm -hmm. Okay. So noted, uh, Stephen? Yeah, just uh, on that topic, um, there is publicly accessible data on the number of um, residents in nursing homes. So if um, it's helpful, I'll, I'll send you that and the source. That it. should go to Marie. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, to Marie, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question I would have is, you know how I was mentioning Stephen. about duels, um, it seemed like this would be a good place to, describe that and you could say I want to say it's something like 15 percent or so of older people on Medicare are duals you know something like that so noted um sorry about that you can feel free to send your citation that you had mentioned a minute ago to the entire commission but let's make sure that Marie also you know that let's make certain that Marie gets it and there's a deadline on that next Friday so anybody that's volunteering to send anything to Marie with, with their summaries or the links, the reports, it's got to be to Marie by Friday. So she's got time to put everything. I'll do that. I'll do that this weekend. And then I'll send it to you, Bonnie, as well. Okay. Margaret, did you have anything else? Um, yeah, I, I think the third dot point, 3% uh, of older adults in Washington County live with their grandchildren. And is it one percent of older adults? Yes. Serve? Okay. Um, it. It. Um, I mean, I. I think it's grammatically correct, but I. I think people might be confused that the grandchildren are serving as caregivers. Yeah, that um, needs to be broken up into two sentences. I agree. Yeah. Two, two bullet yeah. points. Okay. Let's move on to the next page. Just a note that we're on page seven of 17, so. No. Oh. Um, okay, so this is about challenges related to housing that are faced by uh, individuals. Um, anything on this one? Margaret, do you still have your hand up or? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Looks good. Okay. All right, let's move on to page eight. Transportation. This is talking about um, lack of transportation, um, issues relating to coordinated transportation. 
why people need transportation assistance and um, some of the other challenges faced by um, transportation's impact on medical care. That's good and a lot of good citations too. Yeah, there's a lot in there. And I think Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Page nine. Oh, wait, let's go back up to the previous page for a second. That last paragraph. That was what I was trying to recall. We also, um, it also mentions the, in the fact that the perception of lack of availability of transportation also may be a factor here and that there may be some, um, uh, ways in which perception of lack of transportation is actually not accurate, that there's people are missing the information about how to access the uh, transportation that's available. And so we wanted to be sure to address that. Um, Stephen and then Bonnie. Yeah, a um, couple of things. Just in general, and, and I, I'm embarrassed if it's there and I don't know it, but all of the um, references that are listed below, are they available for us to all look at that's There's on this on our site, the, the site where all the documents are? Yes. All right. And then the other thing about transportation, um, I happen to sort of uh, be involved in a program with St. Joe's that has, um, that also now is uh, open to University of Michigan and everyone. And it's where um, people who have an, a condition um, can call their doc or their home care agency or a nursing home retirement community and call, not, and instead of an ambulance coming out and bringing them to the ER, they can actually, in partnership with their doctor or an ER doc, treat them in place. And I think that that's a big issue. In other words, that a real need is that what happens is people get sent to the ER necessarily because there's an economic issue where ambulances are only paid if they transfer people to the ER generally. And, um, and so that's what happens when a lot of these people will be treated at home. And so somewhere in this, I don't know if this is the right spot or somewhere else, is that issue about unnecessary transfers when care can be delivered in the home. And, yeah, and maybe there's a different spot, but I, I think that, that that really should be mentioned. Um, and we could you know, if there's benefit, we could reach out to um, your and Valley Ambulance to, to give a sense of that. But, you know, something like they have data on it that over 50% of transfers to the ER could have been, are, are not emergent and could have been treated in the home or maybe not even, um, you know, it could have been treated in a doctor's office. Okay, let's so note that and ask Marie to, have a look at that. You know, I can I say something about that? I got Bonnie and then Elizabeth. Yeah, let Margaret jump in on that one because mine's different. If it's the same thread, go Margaret, ahead. Go ahead. Well, Steve, I, I think that is um, not this kind of transportation we're talking about. I, I think it goes maybe if I, you know, I didn't get a chance to read this ahead of time because I didn't receive it, but it's, it's, um, it's really not general transportation. So maybe we should put it aside. It might and be fit it. somewhere else. It might fit yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good thought. Okay, Bonnie and then Elizabeth. Okay, um, just a little bit on the transportation. Where you, I think because I participated in, in, in doing this survey, when you're talking about need, and I have personal experience on this, the transportation available Monday through Friday was okay but my mother had dialysis on Saturday and it was non-existent. So there, I mean, so, you know, we, we think of the Monday through Friday type of things. So that might also be what is, what is influencing the need of transportation is for, you know, what, what their specific need is at their specific time. Either there's not available because they don't have enough drivers or they don't have enough vehicles that can, you know, and you get, and you're on a wait list, you know, so that, you know, there, there are really good services out there, but I think that might be what's influencing it is, um, 
so that's where that perception comes in or because their actual specialized needs at the time that they called they could not get transportation you know that particular day or they didn't have three days notice to call or whatever so that could also be what's what's influencing not necessarily that they don't know about it but it they do know about it but it couldn't meet their needs so i don't know just you know just to let you know that that a lot of folks did know about the transportation it just didn't fit into their world at that particular time when they needed the transportation for whatever reason. And I think we should note that that needs to be pointed out in that same vicinity. Okay, Elizabeth? I would agree that scheduling uh, when the, the State Advisory Council on Aging looked at transportation, that was a key thing. The difference between business hours Monday through Friday, evenings and weekends mm -hmm. uh, difference in, in scheduling. So I think that is worth a sentence or two. Then mm -hmm. the other general point, um, it sounds like a great program, Steve, but I, I think we're talking a lot about um, needs and gaps in this rather than programs that address needs and gaps and our potential solutions. So one thing we might want to do as we discuss and these different kinds of programs come to mind is make a note and almost have a parking lot for a future document we might want to consider that identifies some of the innovative solutions that exist that could be expanded. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Thank you for sharing that. Stephen? Yeah, I think, I mean, a couple of things. So Elizabeth, I agree with that. I think that there is still an issue in regards to people receiving home-based care, both urgent care and primary care in the home for those who, um, you know, it's a big issue to um, get access to, to those. Um, and then the only other thing I want to mention about transportation is that um, there's transportation, which, hey, you go into a cab and you're fine to go into a cab. I think the two issues that are really worth thinking about is one is, are cab drivers trained to support frail older people um, so that they can enter into a car, for example, and leave a car safely because it's definitely an at-risk moment in frail people's lives in which there are a lot of falls. And then just in general, cabs are waiting on the driveway, but there's the whole issue about sort of the getting the person from their house to the transportation. That's a very different issue in which there's often a lack of um, trained people or even a lack of anybody ready to go to the door to get people as opposed to having to get them there. So it's a, it's a huge issue for a you know, population that's frailer, um, that's worth you know, sort of mentioning, I think, here, but it could be elsewhere. Okay, well, so note that as well. Bonnie, did you have anything else before? Yeah, I did. Um, the, the, I, I'm hearing two different things here. One, um, that Stephen is bringing up about the programs with the ambulance and things like that. To me, that is more of a, where we address where seniors don't know how to access information or they don't know that programs exist. So if it, it's a program that already exists, it's a great program, it serves seniors, but nobody knows about it. I think we address that later in the communication issue. And, and we pointed that out about there's, you know, the, the centralized repository where people can go to get information on what services are available. And back to Stephen's note about cabs, cab drivers will not help you get in and out of the cab. They do have specialized drivers that do, that are trained. But again, we go back to that wait list and that they're, you know, we just don't have enough to fill the needs for the seniors and our seniors are growing. So, I, I, you know, so there, there's kind of two different things and I'm making notes so we can kind of beef up those areas in the, that part of the um, presentation. Okay, let's move ahead then. Um, unless, do you have more, Stephen? No, sorry. Okay, page nine, socialization. And I, th okay, so. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> it's at this point 
where um, the social isolation or the lack of socialization becomes um, important. Now, I, um, I don't know, is there another section on social isolation as a problem? I don't believe so. Okay, well, I must say- Bennett, you're writing something to add to this, are you not? Well, let me say, during the last week, I had other commitments and couldn't get involved. But I would, uh, I don't like the connotation of socialization, which in and of itself is quite positive. We've got a big problem. Now, I don't know, um, you know, we're living in a world of uh, unexplored implications, if you will, and that's a world of dangerous viruses. So, I mean, that is what I would be developing. And then there are those, including Anthony Fauci and other epidemiologists, who say that this is an, an end, endemic. And indeed, if it is, um, this is what we're going to have to live with. And you have epidemiologists who spend all their time examining the virtually infinite number of mutations for one that may be as lethal as the other three that we have survived. Okay, so but, um, but my Matt, point, okay. Let, let me ask you, the entire first paragraph of this page is about social isolation. Okay, well, then you've answered my first question. I would... <laughs> I would have to, um, okay, I will go over it. I think that, uh, that there have been revisions. Uh, I will be dealing with some of the uh, medical um, consequences of um, extended social isolation. And thank you very much, Bonnie, because I am using the 2020 report that you recommended way back when. Um, I don't know, okay, whether you want me to comment about it, but I don't see any reference uh, to medical consequences. If you, if you and, read the, the entire first sentence addresses Social the negative impact of social isolation on physical health, blood pressure, dementia, heart health, mental and emotional well-being. Those are all mentioned in the first sentence. Okay. Well, uh, it is different from what I saw initially, and um, I can't really comment. I imagine that the uh, documentation uh, may well come from, in part, the 2020 report. Now, so I, the only thing I would add is that in the week that I would have to produce it, if in fact I make revisions, uh, would there be any time for comment about it? What we're asking you to do, anyone who has anything that they want to add to this report, that they draft it and send it to Marie no later than Friday, the 25th of March. Okay, uh, and that is roughly a week, right. right. Okay, thank you. And of course, anything um, that we produce must be cited. There must be citations included. Correct. So, um, and you know, I think it's important to note that the needs assessment subcommittee has been, you know, revising this feverishly um, they've gotten numerous amounts of comments, and then we went over it again at the officers' meeting and uh, made more comments. Uh, and so every time you get a new version, you, you need to know that you, when you get something, it's the new version, and you probably want to refer okay. to that one. I think that there has to be a sense of the gravity of the uh, new period uh, that we're living in now, mm -hmm. and that it is uncharted territory. What we do know is that it's dangerous, number one, for everyone, but most dangerous for seniors. And, uh, you know, the data 70 to 79 is, uh, explodes in terms of uh, data and it gets worse 80 to uh, 89. Okay, there you go. Looking forward to seeing what you write. Um, Stephen? Yeah, just a... Um... One thing that I would mention about or two things in social isolation. 
One is, you know, this might be a moment where we um, comment co or have a commendation for the, um, it, you know, the the internet and broadbanding thing, but also yeah. commenting on that older adults, you know, in that 75 and over often are not comfortable technically to, or do they necessarily, if they're at the poverty level, have things like iPads or others. So um, I don't know, I think that's an issue with social isolation, especially during a COVID period, that at having access to a way of communicating by video is a big deal. And so I don't know when that comes in there, but I would comment yes. on, on that. Um, it comes up in the next couple of pages. All right. And then the second thing about social isolation, and probably Bennett could speak to this, is a lot of people get both socialization and spirituality out of going to their church or synagogue or mosque. And um, the ability to do so when their um, things are, you know, people are frailer um, and or COVID related is a big deal to a lot of older adults. And so um, that might be elsewhere, but I think it's really important to talk about transportation to religious institutions, as well as um, how social, the, the social isolation of, of something like COVID winds up leading to people not being able to participate in an important part of their life. We'll so note that and thank you. Ellen? I put my hand down. Okay, cool. Okay, let's <laughs> move on to the next page. So now we're on to technology um, and we're talking about um, older adults, uh, barriers to accessing the internet and uh, struggling to um, troubleshoot their devices, uh, lack of broadband access, lack of equipment. I think lack of equipment is in here. I'm not sure it's about that. Bottom. Yeah, the previous page also mentions that they just can't afford it. And, and it, I, I think that comes in through here too. Yeah. To the bottom. yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of information on this page. Okay, next page. Here's some additional information on uh, technology and. Mm-hmm. This is talking about where people get information um, and the need for a centralized system. Right. Anything, Elizabeth? It just occurred to me that people who've not been part of uh, our discussions might not know what a closed loop referral system is. So mm -hmm. perhaps yeah, that could be defined a little yes. more clearly. Good point that, thank you. And we'll note that in the minutes. Anything else? You know, I, I should mention that we have been, that, that the committee has been trying to limit the information to one page per issue, which mm -hmm. has not always been possible. But the, you know, the temptation is to include every last little detail, but then of course you run into an 8,747 page document which no one is going to read. So um, boiling it down has been a challenge. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to page 12. This addresses financial hardship, uh, troubles paying bills and debt are the two things that are specifically mentioned. I see no hands, so let's move on to page 13. <clears throat> so this is um, adding layers, uh, racial equity, uh, political and economic power, and po the effect of poverty on the situation. Um, <clears throat>
I see no hands, so we'll move on to page 14. Hey, one quick thing, um, Marta, on that. Yeah. Um, that you know, I thought that the Office of Economic Development, if I remember correctly, um, I forgot her name, gave her a presentation. And I was wondering if you, um, if she was read, um, reached out to, to see if there's any other information that she has that might be helpful for I'm describing. Page, are you speaking about page 13, Stephen? Yeah, I think it was page 13. Go back to page 13 for a minute, Stephanie. And by the way, one uh, just in general, like Maggie had mentioned, she had not gotten this report. Um, and I, I was thinking the report, you know how I said I mentioned it, that I read it a while ago. I realized that's, I don't think I got it either. Um, so I don't, I'll talk to, you know, send an email or, or text to Peter. Can we I, scroll I, up and see the citations so we can see? But anyway, so. Um, the information. So there is no specific citation to the Office for Community and Economic Development, but that would probably be explained by the fact that their information is based on other research. It is. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just so it might be, a, and, I, and maybe the presentation, I can't say I reviewed it, you know, since she gave it, but maybe that has information that might be of value. Um, and, I, and I don't know if this is a place also that you'd mentioned the percentage of duels, but this, you know, it seems like that would be the natural. Can you, can you, um, Steph, it, yeah. can you not blow this up, but put it back to regular size? Um, um, one other thing about this also is, so we know that people on Medicaid have the potential to get home and community-based services, um, but unless it's changed, there's a huge waiting list to be able to stay at home um, and not go to a nursing home um, because of that waiting list. So people are unnecessarily being living in nursing homes that, that really could stay at home. And I don't, I don't know if this would be a place to talk about the waiting list for home and community-based services so that um, we could support, support more of our fellow older people to be able to remain in the community. I think that does belong here. There is a paragraph on caregiver services. So maybe we should uh, ask Marie to, you know, look into, you know, maybe just a sentence or two that addresses that issue. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie and then Elizabeth. Okay. All right. I'm going to jump in here and put my proposal writing hat on because I've been working on these two proposals for two days. And to Flip back to say to have Marie go in and write something, Marie go in and write something. We've got a ton of stuff. So if, you, if you've got issues, Marie has asked that if you have specific issues cite and citations to go with them that you wanna add, write what you have and send to her and then they can melt it into this report and put it where it fits. But I don't think that it's, to me, I don't think it is fair just to say to have Marie go out and research this and Marie research that. If there's something that you want to have in there and you've got the citations, write it, give the citations, send it to Marie, and then she will fit it. We'll, we'll work, the, the committee that's working on this will fit it in the appropriate spot where that it goes and it best reads and fills in. Because yeah, I, otherwise, there's no way Marie is going to get this done and we have to present this. So... Um, you know, your very specific things that you want, they're great, but you've got to write them, send them to Marie, send the citations, and then they'll, they'll if, she, if then if she has any questions, then she can reach out to whoever the author is and, and ask them specific questions on where they fit best. But yeah, just, yeah. By the way, I can just speak for myself. I, that's my plan. This weekend okay. um, that would will be, be great. the time that I'll do that. That'd be great. And I think um, I've probably contributed to that misperception. Um, so I think before we finish this discussion, we will review who is working on some stuff for Marie. So Bonnie, if we could go back to your notes as to what needs to be included and tag people so we know who's writing up. Oh, please. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> but, but I just want Marta, as I said, I have to leave at 10. So. Um, anything that you want to, you know, if you want me to do, just you wouldn't mind emailing it to me. Uh, but I, I think I have 
a sense of it all. I didn't write it down. So if you, if somebody wrote it down, you wouldn't mind emailing my tasks. That would be very appreciated. Actually, your tasks are what you want to have added to the report. Right. Whatever, no, but there were certain comments want, that I think. you want to add to the report in your citations, write in, and send it to Marie by Friday. Okay. okay. I just felt like um, Mar um, Marie or Marie Ann Marta had comment specific things that they specifically wanted to address. I want to make sure that those are especially captured. If you can't do it, it's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, Let's see, where are we? Elizabeth. <clears throat> I know I'm repeating myself, but I'll do it anyway. I would like to reemphasize that this is a report to the Board of Commissioners. There is only so much material that they will review. Whether they should read a very long report is not the issue. My experience in dealing with governmental entities on the local and the state level throughout my entire career is that you have to be very concise. And although people have many points that are of interest and are importance, I would like to urge us to be as concise as possible. I think that the uh, folk, the committee who wrote this did a great job about identifying the major themes and supporting the needs. And maybe if we read it and go, is there, instead of looking at the lens of, does this include everything? Look at it through the lens of, this is the theme are we adding supporting evidence here that makes the case that there's a need? That's a good point, Stephen. <clears throat> yeah, Elizabeth, I, I agree with you. I think you know maybe part of the burden is anyone who thinks there are opportunities for improving it, it also looks at opportunities to reduce language, you know, and so that you're almost saying, okay. I think this is important, but this one doesn't really add as much value. And, and again, I, I really appreciate how good this is. So I expect that the people who receive our recommendations, some of them they're going to include and some they're not. Um, and to me, as they've worked so hard on it, that that's that should be their choice because we got to get it in. Um, but I'll also make a point for myself of sort of looking at things I might remove and send that in as well. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to page 14. So this sort of tries to pull together um, the transitions relating to age and aging and uh, class, race, and gender. Um, Stephen, do you mean to have your hand up? Nope. No. All right, moving on to the next page, page 15. So this uh, goes back to the uh, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation's root cause uh, study and some of the action strategies that they uh, proposed and uh, adopts some of those. Seeing no comments, page 16. So this is the conclusion page. Um, this is basically our list of asks for the county commission. <coughs> Ellen, did you have your hand up? Yes, um, I did. Um, I wanted to say that when I read this, and I had to read it a few times, the, the, and I made notes, but I was making notes about what to talk to my county commissioner about, because I wanted to focus on the priorities in a, a short conversation. 
And I thought this was great. This is so after I made my notes, I came to this page the first time and I thought this was great. And this is um, focusing the information. So I thought the report, I don't have as many questions, but I thought the report was done very well and it's very readable, but I liked this page. So I just thought I would tell you that. Thank you on behalf of everyone. And there's been a whole colony of people working on this report, of course. Yeah. Uh, Stephen and then Margaret. Yeah, um, so I guess the question is, we talked a lot about um, the millage. <laughs> And my question is in regards to, I know that we as a group haven't sort of said, yes, we think there's a millage. I think we heard Jason is supportive of it. Um, it seems like if we're gonna have an audience with the commission and if they would ever read a document like this, that, it, that we would wanna put that down Stay. as something that we support in this. Do you feel like that's here? I don't see it. Well, that's the very last line on that. Oh, page. supporting merit based ballot request. Yeah, we'll fix that typo. That'll be fixed. Okay. Yeah, mileage. Yeah, that was my rule. <laughs> and yeah, and, and my tendency would be to put that higher up there. Um, just because, I mean, really, when a push comes to shove, the two things that we <laughs> want them to really focus in on is the ARPA senior priority fund and, and the millage. So having it last somehow can easily, um, you know, sort of think that that's where our last priority. I mean, my oh, tendency no, would be to bold, to bold face those two items of the millage and ARPA senior priority funding. Well, Stephen, that's a strategic issue. Um, and, you know, I strongly advocated for put, putting the millage as the last line, and here's my reasoning. Um, <clears throat> Certainly we have the ARPA fund available and that's certainly gonna be a recommendation that's gonna come forward on that. But also we do not want the county commission, this is my opinion, I do not personally want the county commission to defer to Millage as the only resort for coming up with funds for addressing senior issues. I think that the county has a responsibility to look at their budget and determine whether there are other sources of funds that they can make available to address some of these needs and gaps. And they also have a responsibility to have a countywide strategic plan that addresses healthy and fulfilling aging. And if we don't put those pieces in place, then, you know, those are, I think, to me, things that should be addressed before a millage is, you know, put out there. But this is a strategic question that we have to debate as a team. Yeah, I, I mean, I do disagree with you on that. I think <clears throat> that we've had enough information from the services industry and, and the data that has been in this report to suggest that a millage, in, in my sense, considering our role would be something that shouldn't be put off. Any, you know, when we have the potential to put it on this year's ballot. Um, so yeah, we do have a disagreement on that. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to be there if we have a vote, but I think strongly that we need to, if they're gonna ever read this, that that needs to be our ultimate message um, to that there's an urgency to get the millage on the ballot and for there to, for us to use the opera things. And maybe one of these reports has to explain how they're different because it's not for the same purpose. One is for continuing to make sure that older people can stay in the community. And one is specifically for a short term sort of um, you know, benefit and that this may or may not be the time to do it, but I think our support for those should be in bold, bold letters, front and probably in the beginning and then at the end. That's me. This is, this is not being adopted today. We're adopting it at our next meeting. So there probably will be a debate about that subject at our okay. next meeting. All right. Margaret? I, I do have to leave. Thank you so much for uh, tolerating me. <laughs> and Bennett and then Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, well, I, I just want to say, I think this is a fabulous report. Um, and I, I just uh, wanna congratulate the people who put it together. I think we need to realize that um, the commissioners will probably not read it very carefully. Um, so I think conciseness 
is um, if you can um, weigh all the evidence that's been presented today to put into it, be careful because it's only going to make it longer. Um, I'm wondering, Marta, when you um, make your presentation, are you using this as kind of the framework for your presentation? And, and, and if so, I think it's critically important that you be brief. Um, <laughs> because I, I just know the intention, attention span for these folks is uh, pretty, pretty tight. So well, having, having sat on uh, the township board, I have an idea of what it's like to be on the other side of that table. So, yeah. uh, and I'm going to try to be brief and I don't think they're gonna give us any more than about 15 minutes. So it's gonna be a challenge to cram all this information uh, to summarize, I should say all this information in a way that's meaningful and doesn't involve speed talking. So, <laughs> Okay. Have, have have you thought at all about, I, and this is their drawbacks to this, have you thought at all about an executive summary um, oh, wow. um, that people who aren't going to read it at least know what the topics are in it? Well, the table it's, of contents is there. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just a thought. I think sometimes it helps people who aren't going to read the whole thing, um, sort of get them on board for your presentation, but you do what you- You probably you know. aren't gonna like this, Margaret, but how would you like to tackle taking on the executive summary? <laughs> well, be pretty brief. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'll, you know, I have, again, I didn't receive it, so I haven't read it, but let me think, let me see if I think I can, do that. Well, you have until next Friday. Okay. And uh, I believe that you are already, I believe, Stephanie, did you not already send out to her to make sure she had this? Yeah, I have it. I got it this morning. Yeah. Okay, good. So you have what you need. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. All right. Okay, Bennett and then um, okay. Elizabeth and then Bonnie. Well, I do want to uh, ditto Margaret's <laughs> suggestion. And I know in the past when I've been looking at the work of uh, commissions or whatever, I, uh, I start with the executive summary and I will go back and forth. So I do think it's a good idea. I will say that I do as well think that the report is excellently done. And that is, um, of course, um, the except because I have not, uh, finished, if you will, uh, the one uh, area in which I have concerns. So um, I would only say this, that I think it will be difficult for me to convey a sense of gravity with regard to the new viral age we're living in, where there hasn't been anything. But that will be my challenge as we go forward. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth and then Bonnie. I'd like to propose um, a middle ground to the executive summary, just as an idea, because sometimes uh, in my experience, people look at the first page of the last page. So perhaps instead of titling this in conclusion, make it recommendations and expand it by some sentences instead of this report has identified several needs and gaps, say this report has identified these needs and gaps and highlight again, transportation and all those subject areas, maybe expanding that sentence. Um, so, try to fit what we can in one page. And if you do have an executive summary, I would also repeat some of those sentences on the last page, just to grab the people who turn to the last page, just a, a thought. And then it's too bad Stephen is not on the call because I really disagree with him. And I agree with you, Marta, in the way the recommendations are laid out because they kind of fit 
time. They also, I think, are point out that key point that we're throughout this report, we're saying that there are more and more older adults who are a key part of Washtenaw County's population. And there are going to be lots of places where our needs need to be considered, not just through a millage, but for in all these different areas. Like when we consider when transportation authorities think about services, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, from my experience, it's the last recommendation that gets read first because it's at the bottom of the page and that's where people's eyes go. So actually, I think the millage, both in terms of, of sequence of thinking, but also where people's eyes are gonna go, if you wanna be real pragmatic, that's where my eye went first. And I, I think it's highlighted, I do think maybe bolding re recommendations, some and not might, I guess I would like the commissioners to think through all their different options because I think they will be more committed to it rather than just going yes, no. So that's my two cents. Okay, so Elizabeth, I'm gonna tag you with writing that paragraph. I will. And Margaret, if we can, if it'd be okay with you, maybe we can touch base so you can give me some of the thoughts of what pops out to you as the most important things to do in an executive summary so I can copy you. That would be wonderful. So Elizabeth, tell me what, are you working on this last page? Yeah. Okay. So I wanna make sure that we tag team. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I will work on the executive summary and send it to you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, all right. Excellent, okay. Um, Bonnie and Bonnie, we need, really need to move along. Yes, the, <laughs> this, this page um, here, um, I, I felt was very important because, and I love the idea of the executive summary I, um, because when I read multiple, multiple proposals and reports, I read the executive summary and I read the recommend in conclusions and recommendations or conclusion, you know, findings, findings and recommendations. Oh, findings. I like that. The findings and recommendations is usually what the title, something like that was. Um, and I don't, I don't think, I mean, I like the way the bullets are presented. Bullets typically mean that there's not really um, ranking one over another when you have bullets. Um, I don't like that idea of bolding. I don't think we need to bold. And I think the board of commissioners knows the difference between ARPA funding and millage funding and what they support. So I, I you know, we have to know our audience. I, I think they know the difference. They've been living this, they've been breathing this. Um, so like you said, you know, know your audience. And, and I like the idea of of reiterating the high key points of needs and gaps to remind them, especially if they don't really get into the meat and potatoes of the report, if they look at the executive summary, if they look at the findings and recommendations, and then they look at some of the graphs and citations, we'll get them. We'll get them to where we want them to be because we'll have enough information that's easy for them to summarize, you know, what it is where, you know, we want them to walk away from this. Plus. Plus we have Marta in her presentation as well. So Marta will be speaking to this. So, I mean, Marta will be hammering home what our thoughts are, what, you know, where we want them to go in the 15 minute presentation that she has. Um, so, you no, know, I, I like both of those ideas. So I'm really looking forward to um, Margaret and Elizabeth's um, addition to this. I think it will be great. And I think we should also note that that presentation that I have to make to the Board of Commissioners is going to include three parts. One part is what did we do in 2021 mm -hmm. that we've already approved that report. The second part is this report and the third part is the ARPA committee recommendation. So those all three parts have to be crammed into about 15 mm -hmm. minutes. So this is gonna be a real task and 
you know, obviously I am not going to be mentioning every single point in this report. It's just not humanly possible. Um, I, I, I'd kind of, if I can ask um, Peter, I'd kind of like to know what he thinks about an executive summary. Hello, um, I think an executive summary is a, is a very good idea. Um, I think uh, knowing, knowing the board, um, there's, there's a wide variety of how much like reading is done beforehand versus kind of allowing the presentation to kind of react to it. Some people will read a 17 page report. I can see two commissioners reading this entire thing. I can see another five waiting until the meeting. I can see another two really liking that executive summary. So I think having a couple different ways to share it with them, an executive summary, a full report, and the presentation is just going to make it a little bit easier to digest and meet each of them where they're at, just because some of them being on the board is their full-time job and they're going to read every single document that comes to them. Others, it's their part-time job um, because it is officially a part-time job. Uh, and they, they really kind of show up to the meeting and want to react to presentations and be able to look at one page at the same time that the presentation is going. So I think having a couple of different uh, uh, medium to share that information is, is a great idea. And I, I, I think an executive summary is a, is a strong idea. Thank you. Elizabeth, and then we really do have to move along. Quick question for Peter. Um, Marta is making the presentation. Thank you so much, Marta, for undertaking, representing everything we've done in more than a year and 15 minutes. Would, is it helpful, even if we're not going to comment and talk, would it be helpful for the other members of the commission just to attend the meeting work group, or is that not how it's formatted? Uh, I, I think that's a good idea. Um, uh, typically working session is a little less focused on like public participation. There's only one minute public comments. Um, but whether you attend in person and are just standing behind and just kind of like give thumbs up and wave and kind of introduce yourself after the meeting, because there's usually 10 to 15 minutes after a working session before the board meeting to, to make that initial follow up with your commissioner in person. Awesome. Or if you want to call in and be in the list and just raise your hand during public participation and say, with the Commission on Aging, super excited for y'all to hear um, Marta's presentation. I think that can also be an impactful thing. So uh, I, I wouldn't say it's it's a big deal if you can't make it for whatever reason. Wednesday night meetings don't work for everyone, <laughs> but if you can, I think it's a nice gesture. Thank you. Okay, I think we're gonna finish sharing the screen and move ahead to um, the rest of the subcommittee reports. I think it's, uh, we're not going to go over the ARPA proposal in detail today, but Bonnie is going to report on what the ARPA subcommittee has been up to. Yes, we have a very good um, working draft right now. Um, I, I was very happy to hear um, Jason's comments, so I was hoping for those. That's good. Um, I do have a, I sent a little email out to Peter asking for his uh, specific expertise on um, some of direct language to make sure I'm interpreting things correctly as far as funding buckets and the way to present that. Um, but we should have it very soon. Um, my team's gonna meet again. We're gonna go over citations and make sure we got everything as beefed up as we can. We have a lot of them. Um, I, I'm really happy. Everybody's worked really hard. I'm hoping everyone will like it very much. And I will try to get that, um, I was going to ask the group, do you want to see it as soon as we get it done to send it out so you have as much time to read it over before the next meeting that we're going to go over it? Or do you just want it to come through as a, um, from Stephanie, like, like the Tuesday, Wednesday, like what we've been doing before the meeting? What is your preference? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I, I would say earlier is better. Okay. I, I just need to make sure I get it. <laughs> Stephanie. We all, we all have stuff going on. So the earlier we can get it, the better yeah. it is, uh, mm -hmm. easily. Okay, so what I'll, what I'll do is since 
when we send it out, I'll just ask for you guys just to send me back a yay, I got it message. So if I don't see a yay, I got it message, I'll make sure that, you know, I'll, I'll loop back around with Stephanie again to make sure that everybody gets it on the on the commission, okay? Great. Okay. Um, potential millage, that would be Elizabeth. We have not met since our last meeting. Our last action step we identified was after the um, data summary report to read it and see if there are ways that we could be helpful in providing any more data and information that might be helpful for the commissioners to use in their decision-making process. Thank you. Okay, in summary of this section, and I know I've said this a couple of times, but I'm saying it one more time. If you have anything to add to the needs assessment report, it needs to go to Bree by Friday, the 25th. With okay. citations. With citations. Okay, next discussion item is the 2022 meeting calendar. Um, we've kind of reverted by um, default to the pattern we had last year, which was the first and third Fridays at 8.30. And we've been kind of delaying whether to adopt an entire meeting calendar for the rest of the year. I think at this time, uh, since we've, we're kind of on that pattern anyway, that I would propose that we just go ahead and set the entire 2022 meeting calendar as the first and third Fridays at 8.30. Uh, I'd be interested to know what the rest of you think about that. We can always cancel meetings if we don't have enough to talk about, but so far we haven't had that problem. Fine, fine. I make the motion. Okay, it's been moved by Bonnie. Yes. Seconded. Then it's supported. Um, can I can I ask is is uh, Jason able to be with us more often? I think that um, Jason is doing the best he can under the circumstances of his full time employment and his responsibilities as a county commissioner. And I don't think we can expect his attendance pattern to change very dramatically. We did ask him if there was another day of the week that would be better, and he said not really. Okay. Anything else before we have Stephanie call the roll? Stephanie? Yep. Uh, Marta Larson? Yes. Marie's out. Uh, Bonnie Weber? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? You can put your thumbs up if yes. <laughs> You're saying yes. Got it. Um, Steve's out. Uh, Bennett Stark? Yes. And Margaret Reynolds? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> under the report from the chair, um, we'd originally thought that I would be making my presentation to the County Board of Commissioners the first meeting in April. It's now tentatively scheduled for April 20th, which I think is better because we have a tremendous amount of work to do on this presentation before it's ready. Um, and it will be, you know, as I said, in three parts and the middle part, a needs assessment will be based on the needs assessment report we are working on today. The other thing is uh, the officers have been scrambling around trying to have meetings and get the agendas together and get materials together for you. And we are now working on trying to get this information out a little further in advance. So, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday before a Friday meeting is pretty short notice, and we're going to try to do better on that. Please know that that's our goal. That's all I have from the chair. Um, we have no new business. Um, I wanted to, um, oh, Peter, you have your hand up? Yeah, I actually do have just a quick piece of uh, new business just for everyone. Uh, as you all know, there is a vacant seat in uh, uh, District 1, which is kind of the north uh, northwest part of the county. Um, if you go to washna.org um, slash BOC, uh, there is a link that says uh, public notice um, for, uh, let me check to make sure I have the exact right name before I tell you something that doesn't quite look right. Uh, public notice for vacancies on several county boards, um, BRA, CAB, HCMA, and Commission on Aging. So if you know anybody in that district and want to promote that link anywhere, 
Uh, that link is available. I can send it all to you after this meeting, but just wanted to highlight that the link for applications for District 1 is currently open. Um, so just wanted to flag that. Thank you. And I do know people that may be interested, so that's good to know. Uh, Bennett? Yeah, we do have a uh, consumer, a member of the aged cohort, Will Purvis, who has offered to talk before us. He is the Director of Planning and Program Operations at the Center for Independent Living. So I do think it's good to have contact uh, other than me with someone who is a quote consumer, close quote. Thank you. And that actually brings us to the next agenda item, which is potential future topics. And this is where we're going to park a request for potential future presentations while we try to fit them into our agenda. So we will duly add the Center for Independent Living as a request that you made at this meeting. You will see that there's another one that had been requested by um, Stephen Stein about nursing homes. That's also in that, um, I, for lack of a better term, list of potential future topics. And the third item on there is a review of bylaws. Um, so all the three of those things are things that the officers will draw from when we're setting up agendas for future meetings. And you will see them there until we cover them and then they'll drop off that list and probably other things will take their place. So thank you, Bennett, for bringing that up. Okay, um, our next meeting is April 1st. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Bonnie and then Elizabeth. Yeah, I just wanted to, to touch bases. I, I asked to park that future bylaws on there um, the, the, to let everybody have a chance to think about it. In our bylaws, it talks about that we're meeting in person. I would like to have us um, revise our bylaws to say that we can meet remotely in per or in person um, so that we can continue meeting remotely, not just we get locked into someday we have to go back to meeting in person. And um, I just thought that the timing would be good right now while we have a board of commissioners that understand everything because our, our changes to our bylaws has to go up to the board and they have to approve them. And we have the board members now that are full aware of what we've been going through rather than potentially getting new board members up to the election. So I thought that the timing of it would be right now to be able to do that while we do have support for Zoom meetings and continuing to you know, meet remotely. So mm -hmm. just a little background on what that means. Thanks, Bonnie. And then Elizabeth? Um, both Marie and I uh, try to attend the meetings of the Healthy Aging Collaborative, and we've certainly heard them before present, and I wonder if we want to make sure um, at different times in the course of the year to invite them to give an update about where they're at. We'll put that on the list. Okay, um, so our next meeting is April 1st. At that meeting, um, we will be finalizing the needs assessment document. So be aware that you know that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna review the proposal draft for the ARPA uh, proposal, similarly to the way we did uh, the needs assessment today. And then our next meeting after that is April 15th, at which we, time we will adopt the ARPA proposal and start working on a strategic plan. So those are upcoming highlights of upcoming fun for the Commission on Aging. Does anybody have any final comments before we move to adjourn? Well, okay. Go ahead, Bennett. Well, we were supposed to uh, give reports. Um, and uh, as you know, I am the only member of the, if you will, the pandemic and the aged committee, subcommittee. And I can tell you that uh, now we have passed one month of being in lockdown. And, and as all many of you, I'm sure, would guess, it is depressing. So um, I spend as much time as I can 
outside of um, the senior community. That's not a very pleasant statement, um, but it is just an indication of um, what might be, if in fact I spent uh, as much time as many of the folks do, uh, I do think that I would have an aggravated effect of social isolation. So I'm imparting to you, I guess, my experience as a consumer. So I, that will be my report. Um, I thought that the that committee had combined with the needs assessment committee. No, I? you asked me that, and I said that I would prefer to remain um, as the subcommittee. I said, no, I did not um, accept that. Okay, then we need to have an, um, at least two more people on your subcommittee, um, and one officer and another member of the, of the group uh, before it can be uh, remain as a subcommittee. So uh, I'm not sure really how to proceed with that. Does anybody have any thoughts in the four minutes we have left? Okay, we'll talk about it at the officers meeting and get back to you, Bennett. Okay. Um, anything else? Elizabeth? Um, I was wondering if Stephanie could send us out again, there's that individual contact sheet with the commissioners that has uh, phone numbers and addresses and email addresses to each of us. I can't seem to find it on the site anymore. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to save it. Yeah, I can get that from Peter because I actually don't have it either. So that is so yeah, I'll work with Peter and I'll We'll figure that out. I'll get that out to everyone. It might be helpful to you also. You never yeah. know. <laughs> okay. Then I will entertain a motion to adjourn and we'll get back two whole minutes of our day. Don't move. Uh, and who supports? Support. And I think we can have a voice vote on this one if I'm not mistaken. So all those in favor, push your thumbs up or say aye. Thumbs aye. Up. aye. Looks like unanimous consent. So we are adjourned and thank you everyone for attending and for the dis thoughtful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.